Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture three on introductory statistics. In last class, we talked about uh, frequency distribution table, um, we in which we have a column consisting of the classes or class intervals, and another column consisting of all the frequencies. And then this table is called a frequency distribution table. And from this frequency distribution table, we can determine the lower class limits, the upper class limits, and the interval width. Okay. Now, this is given a frequency distribution table. We can find these values. Now, what about the other way around? So, in other words, given a data set, how can we construct a frequency distribution table, right? So that's going to be the other, uh, what we are going to talk about in today's lecture, how to create a frequency distribution table. Now here we introduce this uh, five steps in creating frequency distribution table. Sorry, this is five steps. All right, so now, how to construct a frequency distribution table using these five steps. Okay, step one, we want to find out the range. So what is the range of a data set? The range is the highest score minus the lowest score. Okay, so in other words, it is the maximum minus the minimum. So we will have, have what? Range equals say x max minus what? x mean, all right. The maximum value minus the minimum value. And then second is gonna be the number. All right, what is the number? The number of class intervals you want to have in your frequency distribution table. All right, for instance, here, in this frequency distribution table, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six intervals here. So that is the number, all right? So it is the desired number of class intervals, usually between five and 20, okay? So this number is usually predetermined or given, okay? It's usually uh, predetermined. or given, okay? So that is the number of class intervals. Now the third one is the width, all right, the width, to determine the interval width. Now, how to determine the interval width? Now we are going to do that by dividing the range by the number of class intervals. The range is the, we obtain the range from step one, the number of classes is usually predetermined, Again, that's what we have in the second step. Now, dividing the range by the number of classes, a number of class intervals, that will give us the width. But in majority of the cases in general, this ratio, the range over the number, this ratio will be what? Will be a decimal point will be a decimal point and also it's not a convenient. So what we are going to do is after we got this ratio, usually we need to round this ratio in either direction. It's run it down or round up. Okay. So usually it is better to run up. Okay. Usually it's better to run up to a convenient number. So here, what do we mean by a convenient number? Now, a convenient number is going to be, um, say, a number easy to remember or easy to calculate, say, like a multiples of 5 or multiples of 10. Okay, multiples of 5 or multiples of 10. Now, another thing is about the roundup. Okay, so if we want to round up to some certain number, now this number should not be, should not be too far away from the ratio. It should be close. 
okay, should be close. Now this closely you know, should be not like too far away from uh, this uh, true ratio. Okay, so now one, it must be, it should be convenient number. Another thing is it should be close to the ratio, not too far away from the ratio. And that's our step three to determine the interval width. We're going to illustrate this step in the example uh, below or right, later. Now, after we got the range, the number, and uh, the width, now we are going to determine the limits. So what are the lower class limits and upper class limits? Okay, so now, in doing so, as you can see from this table, right? So we see that the interval width is 30 and the lower class limits is 60, 90, and so on. So now it is, you can see that this lower limits, their differences are 30. So you have 60, uh, 90, 120, 150, and 180, and 210, right? So they're each, the difference is 30, which is the interval width. Now, in other words, if you can get the smallest um, lower limit, 60, then plus the interval width, you got 90, plus another one, you got 120, 150, 180, and 210, right? So you basically can get all these lower limits if you know the first lower limit. Okay, so, and also then for the upper class limits, as you can see here, 89, 119 to 39 and so on. So 89 and uh, 119, um, 149, okay, 179, 209 and 239, right? So all these ones are what? Ah, so the difference 90 minus one, you got, 89, 120 minus 1, 150 minus 1, 180 minus 1, and this is 210 minus 1. And lastly is, uh, you can say that uh, if you have another level here, so that's going to be 240. So 240 minus 1, you get 239. But we really do not have this interval here, right? So, but you can still using this method to determine the upper class limits. So in other words, now in order to determine all these class limits, it is really important to know, well, the interval width, which we have obtained in the third step. All right, this is the interval width. And then for the limits, all right, if we can determine the first lower class limit, then all these upper class limits can be determined, right? By adding what? The interval width. 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210, and so on. And then you also have what? Then, you know, by uh, taking the differences, you can also determine the upper class limits as well. So it is the key, it is a uh, key importance to find out the value for the first, the first, the smallest lower class limit. Okay, so how to determine the value of the first? lower class limit, okay? So we are going to choose the value for the first lower class limit by using what? Either the minimum value or a convenient value below the minimum. So here again, the convenient value. So what do we mean by convenient value here? Now, again, it should be easy to remember or easy to calculate. So like uh, multiples of five, multiples of 10, multiples of 20, and so on. All right, so it should be some value that is easy to calculate. Um, and uh, another issue is this number should not be too far away from the minimum value. So it is below the minimum value, but uh, it cannot be too far below the too far away from the minimum. Okay, so it should be close. Now this closeness is with respect to the width. All right, it should be the distance between this value should be within the interval width. Or should be within the interval width. 
So, um, for instance, if the width is a five, then the this uh, lower class limit or this convenient number should be, you know, the difference between the convenience number and the minimum value should be less than five. All right, we are going to show this one in the next, uh, in the example below. All right, in the example below. All right, so then now here you have to be careful. Be sure that the intervals are all of the same width. All right, they are consecutive and also non-overlapping, non-overlapping. Okay, now uh, also be sure that the highest interval contains the highest score, all right, the highest score. Now, finally, after we got all the limits, now we can go to step five to find the corresponding frequencies. That is to say, we want to count the number of observations that occur in each interval and enter the count as a frequency of the interval. Okay, so that is the frequencies. Now, all right, let's do an example and see how we can use these five steps to construct a frequency distribution table. Now consider this example. Uh, we are using, you know, uh, this is the example we introduced in the beginning of this chapter. Uh, we have this uh, data set about the weights of the 25, uh, one, two, three, four, or five, one, two, three, four, five, the 25 uh, male students in a statistics class, right? This is the data set that we have. And then we want to construct um, frequency distribution table given here on the right. Okay, so um, now we, uh, we, uh, we will show in this example how to reconstruct this table, how to reconstruct this table are using the steps we introduced, okay? So now, uh, what is the first step? Uh, we can see that there are five steps. The first step is finding the range. So what is the range? The range is the maximum value minus the minimum value. So now we need to determine the maximum value and the minimum value for this example. So what is the maximum value given this data set? Uh, you need to be careful in locating these uh, largest values, all right? So, uh, well, I found that it is 197. All right, 197 is the maximum value. And then you also have to determine the minimum value. All right, so what is the minimum value in the table? So we see that uh, that uh, should be what should be... Um, 135, right? 135 is the minimum value. Then we can determine the range in the first uh, step. Okay, so step one, range equals x max minus x mean, which equals uh, 197 minus 135, and this one equals what? Um, you can calculate this one, this should be 62, right? It's 62, okay? 62 is the range, the maximum minus minimum, we got the range. Now then the second step, what is the second step? Well, it is to determine the number of intervals, the desired number of intervals. This is usually predetermined. As in our example, we want to use what? Seven classes. So the number of class intervals or classes is seven, right? Two. Number of classes, here is seven. All right, this is going to be the second step. Is usually predetermined or it is usually given. Okay, so like this, in this example, this is seven is given. Okay, so question two. And then uh, is going to be the third step, which is to determine the interval width. How to determine the interval width? All right, we take the ratio, all right, divide the range, by the number right, in the first two steps. 
Now let's consider this one. What is the range? What is the ratio? Okay, step three. So we want to find the width. So what we do is firstly take the ratio, the range over what? Over the number. So this is what? 62 over seven. So this equals what? 62 over seven, uh, seven, eight point, you, know, you see this is a 56, eight point, uh, what using the calculator, you may find this one is 86, something like this. All right, 8.86. Okay, now this is going to be you can, uh, the ratio. All right? As you can see, that this number is not an integer and it's not a convenient. All right, so uh, it is a decimal point. It's a decimal point. Okay, now how to, can we determine the width? So what we do is, all right, after we found the ratio, we usually round this ratio in either direction. It's better to round it up, round up, all right, round up. It's better to round up to a convenient number, right, to a convenient number. So this convenient number should be what? Um, easy to calculate and easy to remember, all right? So like a multiples of five or multiples of 10. And another thing is, it should be close. It should be because it's rounded up, right? So it cannot be too far away from the ratio, okay? So for this one, uh, this is 8.86. We round it up to what? To what a value? Uh, you can round it up to what? Nine? Well, nine is okay, right? Nine is round up to the next integer. But I would prefer to use 10. Uh, to use 10, okay? So we are going to run it 10 because what? I think 10 to, at least to me, 10 is easy to remember and calculate, right? The multiples of 10 is easy, okay? So I'm, I'm going to, uh, I would prefer to use multiples of, um, say like the interval width as 10, okay? So we, all right, round it up to a convenient number. Convenient number. And what? And uh, okay, I'm going to write here and use 10 as the interval width. As the interval width. All right, 10. Okay. Um, so this is basically the width. All right, this is basically the width. All right, we 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 take the ratio and then round it up to a convenient number. I right, use ten as the interval width. Okay. Now some may say, okay, you say ten is ten is a, a interval. It's a convenient number. So what about uh, say fifteen? 15 is a multiple of five, right? And why don't you choose 15 instead? Well, here is the question. You are trying to round it up. You should not in, use a number that is too far away from this ratio. Like 15 is almost a double, almost a double this number. That's not a good choice. You want some number that is convenient and also what? Uh, it's close, relatively close to the width. Now for this one, 10 is close and also it is convenient, right? So um, that's why we choose 10 here, okay? Choose 10. Now, because 10 is, firstly, it is convenient. Secondly, it is close, relatively close to this ratio, okay? Now, here is what we mean by a convenient number and round it up to, okay, round it up, it's not too far away, okay? Round it up, not, cannot be too far away. You cannot be, go be double that size or almost double that size. That's gonna be too much, 
right? And also it must be a convenient number, okay? So that's the step three. We chose 10 as the interval width. Now let's consider the fourth step, all right? It's the limits. We want to determine all the lower limits and all the upper limits. Now, as we showed, the key is to determine the first lower limit. So what is the first lower class limit? How to determine that? It is either what? The minimum value or a convenient value below the minimum. All right, so here, convenient value. What do we mean by convenient value? The convenient value is again, easy to remember, easy to calculate, take like multiples of five or 10, right? And also what? It should be below the minimum and it cannot be too far away from the minimum. Okay, it should be within the, uh, you know, the difference between the convenient number you chose and the minimum value should be smaller than the class width. So for our example here, uh, our first, uh, firstly, okay, for, all right, determine the limits. So we need to determine the first one. So as we can see, the smallest value is 135. Now, uh, can we either use the minimum, can we use the 135? Uh, yes. We can use 135. 135 is, al is already pretty convenient, right? It's already a convenient uh, uh, value. You can definitely use it, all right? Definitely use this 135 as the first lower class limit. Now, however, for this example, I would uh, prefer to choose 130, all right, 130. I, to me, it is more convenient. Uh, you know, it's gonna be the multiples of tens, right? I would prefer that, okay? And, um, and it's below 135, and also it is within the difference between 130 and 135, which is a five, now which is what? Uh, smaller than 10, okay? So I can choose 130 as my first lower class limit. All right, so we chose, we choose 130 as the first lower class limit. It's the first lower class limit, okay? Now, if 130 is the first lower class limit, then, what are going? What are the other lower class limits? All right, let's just list it here. The lower one, right? So this is the lower class limits. Now the first one is one thirty. Then the second one will be what? All right, the ten. Remember, ten is the chosen interval width. So uh, the next lower class limit is going to be one forty, right? And then the next one is going to be 150, 160, 170, uh, 180, 190, uh, 200. Well, where shall we stop? You know, this list, right? Oh, where shall we stop? We should, where should we stop? Now, here, uh, you need to what? Because we have the number of classes is seven. So you need to choose seven classes. So you have seven lower class limits. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 190 here is going to be the last one, right? So because we need seven classes, uh, it's not, uh, uh, you, you should stop here, right? Because you, need seven classes. Otherwise it's too much, too, too many, right? So you stop here. Okay, this is the, these are the lower class limits. And then we want to determine the upper class limits. So what are the upper ones? So the upper ones, now, as we see, right, 130, this is 140. So these are all integers in our data set. So we are going to assume that all the values are 
integers, all right, or integer values. So uh, since they cannot be what? Uh, over, of the same width and the consecutive and also non-overlapping and uh, non-overlapping. So the first interval, the maximum value of the first interval should be what? Should be 139 or 139. So which is what? 140 minus one, you got a 139, right? So that is to make sure that these intervals are not overlapping because this is your first interval, and for the second interval, it should be 140 to 149, right? So that is not overlapping with the next one, which is again, 150 minus one is 141, right? And 160 minus one is 159. Ah, similarly, 169, 179, 189, and 199. Okay, 199. Okay, so you got all these upper class limits as well. Okay, so the lower limits and upper limits are determined. So we got all these limits. We got all these limits. Okay, now uh, this is our fourth step. All right, so we determined all these lower and upper class limits. The next, the last, uh, uh, the last step is the frequencies. We are going to count the number of observations that occur in each interval. Okay, and uh, for instance, what? How many values are in the first interval? One thirty to one thirty nine. As we can see, one thirty five and one thirty seven. Right, so there are two of them. So that's why we have two here. So 130 to 139, that's two. And between what? 160 to 169, 160 to 169. Uh, here is one, 164, 163, 62, 61, 164, 164, and 163, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven of them are in occurs in what, in this interval. So that's why here, this frequency is a seven. So we can, now this, we can do, uh, we can count the number of values in each interval, and uh, we can obtain all these frequencies. We can obtain all these frequencies. And finally, we put them together and got this table. And I got this, uh, uh, this is the frequency distribution table, right? So this frequency distribution can be put together. Now you have what? Uh, these are the list of class intervals, and this is the corresponding frequencies. Now, one thing you can you you may you may realize that uh, um, in this table the intervals are in a decreasing order. Right, in a decreasing order, 190 to 199, 180 to 189, and 130 to 139. So you're there in a decreasing order. Now, some may ask, now, can we use an increasing order? Well, yes, you can. All right, if you want, you can put all these intervals in a, increase, in a increasing order as well. Okay, so uh, you can also do that. Okay, so put them in an increasing order that also works as long as what they are in either what monotonic, uh, monotonic order, what either increasing or decreasing. Okay, so that would be that would work. Okay, so here is what we do, right? So first step, we got the range 62, the number, which is seven, and the width, we got this is ratio, and we choose 10. The limits, all right, so we got all these ones uh, here, all right, and, and every, these intervals, the upper and lower class limits, and so on. Uh, and then for the frequencies, okay, so we can get all these frequencies. Now, here is a note, or here's a note. Now, in some cases, we have intervals with no observation. Uh, in certain cases, uh, for that interval, there is just no values belong to that interval. In those cases, we would have put a zero 
as its frequency. Okay, you cannot delete them, even though if they have there uh, the zero. They have only there. There is no values in that interval. Okay, just to put zero there. Just put it. Put zero there. Okay. Now, uh, we will show this in the next example. All right. So, for for instance, let's consider this example. Let's say that you have a list of IQ scores for a gifted classroom in a particular elementary school. Right, the IQ scores are given below, and we want to draw a frequency distribution table with what? Six classes, with six classes, okay? Now, how can we do this? How can we do this? Five steps, right? These are five steps. Now, uh, do you remember what is going to be our first step? As to what? Determine the range, right? So first step, the range, okay? So that is what? Uh, equals the x maximum minus the minimum. So what is the maximum value for this data set? Um, I believe that's what? That's 154. Okay, that's the maximum. So what about the minimum? What is the minimum value? Um, this one you can see, uh, 120, is that 126? Uh, I believe it's 126, right? So here is the 126. Therefore, the range is the maximum 134 minus the minimum 126. What did we get? What did we get for this one? So that's um, that's what, 28? It's 28. All right, 28 is the difference, which is the range, okay? And the second, so what is about, the second step is what? Determine the number of classes, right? The number of classes. Now for our example, this one is already given, it's already given here is six. Okay, is a six. The number of classes is six. Okay, now three, this is the second step. And the third step is to determine what? Determine the width, the interval width. All right, how to determine the interval width? Anybody remember this? So what we do is what? Taking the range divided by the number, divided by the number, then we have what, 28 over six. Now, what do we get for this one? So it is 4.667, if you run to three decimal places. Okay, so this is not a convenient number and it is a decimal number, right? So what shall we do? What shall we do? Can we round it up or down? Uh, usually it's better to round up. Right, we round it up to a convenient number. So for this one, what is a, what is a convenient number for this one? Um, I would say five, right? I think for this one, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so we round it up to a convenient number. number and uh, use what five as the interval width as the interval width okay so we got the interval width that's what five now some may ask why we use a five so what about 10. Can we use a 10 for the interval width instead of 5? I think 10 is also convenient and also what round up, right? Well, uh, what about 10? Okay, so be careful. Here is what we round it up. So this number should be close, very close to the width, should be close to the width. All right, so now uh, multiples of five 
Now, if you use 10, that's almost a double. That's even over double this number, this ratio. That's too much. Okay, so that's why we cannot use 10. All right, we cannot use 10 here because 10 is too far away or too large. It's not close to the ratio. So um, therefore we use a five as the interval width. Okay, so quite, this is a step three. Now, what is the next step? The next step is to determine what? To determine the uh, limits. All right, step four. Okay, I'm gonna write it here. Step four is the limits. The limits, okay? So for the limits, um, what are, um, so it's key to determine the first lower class limit, okay? So which one should we use? The minimum is 126. So we need to take uh, first a lim lower limit, either what? Uh, either the minimum value or a convenient number that is below the minimum. So. For this example, we need uh, 126 is not a very convenient number here, right? So because it's not a multiple of five, it's not a multiple of 10. So we better choose a convenient number below it. So here, uh, what shall we choose? Uh, well, we can choose what, 125. Right, 125 is below 126, and also what it is um, convenient, multiple five. So we will choose 125, right? We choose 125 as our first lower class limit. Now, uh, some may ask, uh, you choose 125. So why don't you choose 120? It's because 120 is a multiple of 10 is more convenient, right? So why don't you choose 120 instead? Now here you have to be careful. You want to choose this convenient number, which is below the minimum value, but not too far away from it. Now, for instance, if you choose 120, okay, 120, then the difference between this 120 and the 126 is what? So 126, the minimum value is 126 minus 120, that is six. So this is six, well, your interval width is a five, right? Your interval width is a five, well, this is six is going to be greater than five. That's too far away from the minimum. You want to choose a convenient number that is what? Not too far away from the minimum value. This closeness is usually what? Within the interval width from the minimum value. Okay, so that's why we better choose what, 125 instead of 120, okay? because 120 is too far away from this minimum value, okay? So after we choose 125 as our first lower class limit, then we can determine all the other lower class limits, right? Using 125 and also five as the interval width. So the lower class limits, will be what? Uh, 125. The next one will be 130, uh, 135, uh, 140, 145, and 150. Okay, uh, can we go for another one? Um, no, right? Why? Why we cannot add a 155 here, for instance? Should we go with 155? No, 
right? Because what? Because we only, in the second step, we know that number of classes is six, right? So you only need six lower class limits. One, twenty, one, two, three, four, five, six. You stopped at 150, all right? So 155 is not needed. Now, these are the lower class limits, and then we can determine the upper class limits. Now, again, you can see that these all these data values are integers. So in order to for them to be a non-overlap, all right, non-overlap, so we need the upper limit for the first interval should be what? One below the next lower class limit. So it should be 130 minus one, so 129, right? And this one should be what? 135 minus one, so 134. This is gonna be 139, 144, 149, and 154. 154, right? So, um, which is 155 minus one. Okay, so we got all the upper class limits. And then, all right, so what do we have? All right, the lower class limits are given here, the upper class limits are given here, and then the finally, we are going to determine the frequencies. All right, frequencies, frequency for each interval. All right, so now, for instance, so let's say that the first interval, all right, 125 to 129, how many are there in this interval? Uh, I believe that's only one, right? Only 126 is inside this interval. So the first thing, uh, frequency here is one. For the second one, 130 to 134, uh, 30 to 34. So one, two. I believe that's just two, right? There are just two of them. And uh, so on, all right? 135 to 39, 35, 39, one, two, three. Four, five, six, and seven. Oh wow, this is seven of them. Okay. 40 to 40, um, 40 to 40, 140 to 144, 40 to 44, one, two, three, four, five, five of them. Okay, so here is a five. And then 145 to 49, 45 to 49, 45. 249. Well, I don't find any. I, 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 don't, I didn't find any, right? So there's no values inside this interval, 145 to 149. So what shall we do? Now, here is what we do, right? In case there's intervals with no observations, we would put a zero as the frequency, right? Because there's no. So here, this frequency is zero. Okay, this frequency is zero. Now, lastly, that's 150 to 154. So we have what? Uh, I believe here is 151 and 154. There's two of them, so two. So these are the corresponding frequencies. Then we're already, uh, sorry, this is a five. Okay, this is step five. After these five steps, we got what? All the class intervals and also the corresponding frequencies. And we can put them together and get the frequency distribution table. So what is it? Okay, so this is the table we have. Okay, this is the table. As you can see in the class intervals, 150 to 154, and these are the frequencies, right? And put them in a table. And you can see that we put these class intervals in an increasing order, right? in an increasing order. Now you can also put it in a decreasing order if you want to, right? So this is what we have for this frequency distribution table, okay? Note, none of the three fall into this one. We still need to list it as an interval and put a zero as its frequency. So for this one, even though there's no such values there, you still have to include it in the table, okay? All right, so that is, the um, uh, methods to construct a frequency distribution table. Next, 
we are going to move on to section two about histograms. Okay, now what is a histogram? Now, by definition, a histogram is a plot of class intervals of the variable. Okay, now waiting our example, a horizontal axis, some, some so called x axis or this one. So, and also the frequency of each interval. So there are two key points, the plot of what? Class intervals and the frequency. Okay, so now uh, it is a graphical presentation of a frequency distribution table. All right, so that's the graphical presentation of a frequency distribution table with the frequencies represented as a vertical bars. Um, uh, it is what? Uh, appropriate for a interval or an ratio data. Now the data at the interval level or the data at the ratio level. Remember what do we mean by ratio and interval and ratio data? Okay, so there are at different levels of measurements, right? So for the interval level um, and the ratio level, right? If you do not understand, if you forgot that, please reveal the previous lab lectures. Okay, all right. So for instance, let's give an example here. Consider this example about students' weights. Now here is the frequency distribution table we had, right? The class intervals, the frequencies, and everything is given here in this frequency distribution table. Now, uh, what is going to be a histogram? Consider this one. This is going to be what it looks like, a histogram. Now this histogram, as you can see, uh, you, they, it is a plot, right? You have X axis, horizontal one axis, and the vertical axis, the Y axis. And they have different labels, here is a, the vertical axis is labeled as F, okay? And the horizontal one is labeled as the weight, which is the variable name. And also in the parentheses, there is, that's the unit of this variable, right? In pounds here. Now, of course, if the variable do not have a unit, you can just uh, list the video name only there. Right, so you do not have to include the unit if it do not, for instance, the counts, right? For counts, do not have the unit. Now, this is a histogram. Okay, this is a histogram. As you can see, is um, there are different what uh, rectangular bars, all right? And uh, below that, that's the corresponding uh, intervals. Okay, and you we also realize that these bars all of different heights or of different heights so let's see what are the heights okay so how these heights are determined okay so let's consider these ones all right these uh, what is the height let's mark these heights out so this is two right so the height is two here two this is five, I believe, right? So five, this is what? Seven, and this is, I believe it looks like three, and this is like a four, and this is what? This is like two, okay? So two, two, five, seven, three, four, two. So what are these values? Okay, all right. See this? Uh, if you read in from the bottom to the top, that's a two, two, five, seven, three, four, two. Right from the bottom to top, two two five seven three four two, and also you have two two five seven three four two. Okay, it seems like what the height of these bars are the frequencies, or the corresponding frequencies, right, of these those intervals. So, all right. So uh, here, uh, how to construct a histogram. Okay, how to construct a histogram. So we're gonna show in the following five steps. Okay, now, step one, you need to have a frequency, a grouped frequency distribution, which is a frequency distribution table. Okay, which is a frequency distribution table. You start with a table here, and then 
Second step, you want to draw the axis. So one is what? The horizontal axis. Another is the vertical axis. Okay. Now with the vertical axis should be labeled as with F. Okay. F means frequency. Okay. The horizontal axis should be labeled with the name of the variable. Like in this one, it is a weight, right? Weight. And also with the unit of measurement in the parentheses. Okay, so if it has one, so put the unit of measurement as well. And finally, what? Enter the class interval ranges on the horizontal axis. So here, 130 to 139, 140 to 49, 150, and so on, right? So we put them together and got this one. Now, question three is the break. Okay, do we need a break? <laughs> okay, what do we mean by the break here? Okay, now it is, um, it is conventional to have the vertical axis interact with the horizontal axis at a point where the value of the variable is zero. Okay, now, if this is not the case in the histogram, like in this one, right? So ours, this interval starts at what, 130, it's not start at zero. So in such cases, what do we do? All right, we add a break at a break sign, okay? There's a break sign here, indicating that where our data is not starting from zero, okay? It's starting from 130 here, okay? All right, so in many cases, we would need this break, okay? You add a break, then indicates with a break in the horizontal axis, okay? And then step four, you want to add edges. All right, so what do we mean by edges? It's draw vertical lines at the edges of the class interval to form the edges of the histograms, histogram bars. So that's the average, the ticks, okay, uh, at the horizontal axis, and uh, you draw these uh, um, vertical lines there, okay. And finally, you determine the heights. So what are the heights? The height of each interval ball should equal to the frequency of the values in the interval. Okay, for instance, now this height is two. So two should be what? Equal to what? The frequency of this interval. Okay, it's two. And also this one is a seven. So this number should be what? Uh, equal to the frequency of what? This interval 160 to 169. As you can see from 160 to 169, the frequency is seven. So that is why we have the height of this bar is a seven. Okay. So now we have these steps. All right, step one, two, three, four, five to determine what? Uh, how to construct a histogram. Now let's consider an example. Consider a frequency distribution table about IQ scores of a given classroom uh, in the last section, construct a histogram here. So this is a table we just, uh, we got in the previous example. Okay, the IQ scores. Now, step one, we already begin with a frequency distribution table. So this is already, we already have this table listed here. Now, what is step two? Step two is the axis. Right, axis. So that is the horizontal and the vertical axis. How to determine that? All right, so we are having a vertical axis and a horizontal axis and so on. So I'm going to draw it here, right? Sketch one. So let's say that this is my vertical axis and this is my horizontal axis. So starting from zero and uh, my uh, vertical axis is labeled with F. Okay, now the, my highest uh, uh, frequency is seven. So I'm going to draw some ticks here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right, so I'm be right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, and in the horizontal axis, I'm going to label it as what? the uh, name of the variable, this IQ score, right? So this IQ score, 
Now, IQ score do not have a, a unit of measurement. Okay, so we will just leave it here, IQ score. Okay, so it is the number counts. Okay, so we do, we just leave it here. And also we have to enter the class interval ranges on the horizontal axis. Okay, so that is to say 125 to 129 and all these one until what, 130 to 134. So we are going to say 125 to 129, 130 to 134, 135 to 139, 140 to 144, 145 to 149, and 150 to 154. Okay, so these are all the intervals we have. Okay, all the class intervals. And then, okay, this is going to be our second step. We have already got all the axes uh, ready, okay, with the labels and also the intervals given here. This is our second step, axis. And the third step is, is to, we need a break. For this one, what? Yes, right? Because what? Our starting value is at 125, it's not zero. So therefore we do need a break and you can just draw a break sign here. All right, so here, okay. So that's, we do need a break. Let's stop step three. And finally, uh, not finally, step four, four, that's the what? Um, the vertical lines, the edges, or the edges. Edges, that's to separate what uh, the plus intervals, okay? So we're going to draw these edges, say that this one is somewhere here, and this is somewhere here, okay? This is somewhere here, and somewhere here, the vertical lines, so we're here. So I'm going. To, I'm just a sketching. All right. So it may not be very exact, but sketching. These are the vertical lines I have. And then finally, I will determine the heights. So what are the heights? So that's a five uh, heights. Okay. So one, two, seven, five, zero, two. So here is a one. So it's somewhere here, right? So one and two. Okay. And then seven, so wow, this one is high, it's tall here, so it's somewhere here. And then five, I believe, five. And this is five. Okay, and then zero, zero is here, right? Zero, okay, and then finally, what? That's two, okay. So two is somewhere here, okay. Now you may erase those Okay. Okay, so that's what we have. Okay, so this is going to be the histogram we have. Okay, this is going to be the histogram we have. All right, so this is how to construct a histogram. And uh, then we you use the um, frequency, we also introduce the frequency polygon. Okay, so which is a very simple is to what? Uh, it's simply a transformation of the histogram obtained by substituting a single point for each bar and connecting the points with straight line segments. Uh, it's customary to connect the first and the last dots to the horizontal axis with diagonal dashed lines. Like take the center points and connect them with the line segments and then connect these with what? This and this, then you got this. Is a frequency polygon. Okay, so for instance, this one is from the middle points. Got all the middle points. Now this one is what here is still here. All right, be careful. Even though the frequency is zero, and connect them with the line segments. Okay, this one goes here. This one goes here. And then do not remember, do not forget to use a diagonal dash the line to connect the first dot to the horizontal axis and the last to the horizontal axis. So, and then this curve is called a what? Frequency polygon. All right, that is all about this lecture. I will see you in the next one. Thank you for your attention.